So thanks a lot for having me. Um, this time from very snowy Switzerland. I'm actually going to show this to make everybody jealous right now. Um, I've been working here at Ungleich for quite some time. Some of you already know me. Um, and we are doing a lot of IPv6 only uh, developments or deployments. Um, before I go fully into the details, I, I think I need a little bit of a recap, like Kubernetes and the whole thing, because we actually had a network group <laughs> meeting. So Kubernetes is not the uh, most typical thing, but I think it's a quite an interesting topic. Uh, so just a short recap for those who are more into networking, less into infrastructures. Like, why would you have a look at this whole thing in the first place? Uh, many of you are not the youngest, and I don't mean this to be disrespectful, but I just want to point out like a lot of people here have a lot of experience. So, you know, the old days when you started like with one or two servers, and then the movement kind of changed in, in the uh, infrastructure area to like automate everything, like to netboot, to have automated configuration management, followed roughly with the whole virtualization move in the, I would say, early 2000s, followed by the containerization, which, you know, started all with Docker, then went into Docker Swarm, Docker Compose, which eventually at the moment ended in Kubernetes. And you can have a lot of opinions about Kubernetes or not, and I'm, I'm not going to discuss this part too much in detail today, but what it does is um, nicely automatically distributing your containers so that you don't need to care what runs where, you don't need to think about scheduling. And if you do the thing right, then you don't even need to think about networking. And this is the part I would like to talk a little bit about. Um, so I said, um, here at Ungleich, we're doing a lot of IPv6 only infrastructures. As I mentioned before the meeting, I'm right now sitting in an IPv6 only Wi-Fi network. Um, there's internally, there's no IPv4 routing. There's no RFC 1918 space. Um, there are no, like internally, there are no uh, IPv4 addresses in this regard exchanged um, only between the upstreams and the actual pops where we have uh, the different uh, workload. Um, overall, we wanted to move towards Kubernetes for quite some time um, with the motivation of standardization and you know, making everything more or less the same. It doesn't work for everything, but um, for some things. And um, yeah, what I want to have a look a bit like it's networking inside of Kubernetes here. <coughs> and what is quite, quite uh, um, quite interesting is in Kubernetes, you have something that's called a CNI, which is a container network interface. So if you actually look at Kubernetes, in quotes, it doesn't support networking because it only supports CNIs. It's not completely true, but the concept is really whatever you use for networking, it is provided by, by a, a CNI plugin. There are a lot of like different names over there that you, uh, probably partially know, probably have never heard of. One of them is a simple Linux network bridge plugin. Um, it goes up with uh, Calico, Cilium, which are uh, open source projects, uh, up to Multus, which is actually a very interesting CNI, which supports multiple networks to a container. And, and this is quite important to know because um, Kubernetes by default per workload, which is a pod, um, only supports one interface or one IP address by default. And, and this already makes probably some of you already think like only one IP address and, and yet, yes, by default, uh, that's how Kubernetes is designed or uh, implemented at the moment. So if you're going to have uh, virtual machines inside containers inside uh, Kubernetes, which is perfectly possible, um, then you can use the Multus plugin for um, providing multiple interfaces to your uh, virtual machine, which is actually quite interesting. Obviously, there are also specialized uh, CNIs like uh, for Azure or for AWS or from, uh, I think the CNI Genie is from Huawei, if I'm not mistaken. So all kinds of solutions for all kinds of different scenarios. And th this brings up a little bit the question like, what is actually in CNI actually doing? And, and the answer is like the whole networking, like everything. And this can be very different from your situation. And I will talk a little bit about this later is a Kubernetes cluster 
is a standard if you want so in the container world but um how the standard is implemented in your infrastructure is very different usually from infrastructure to infrastructure so google is very different to aws to azure to your on-premise thing to um let's say something spawning over vpns and the cnis have a lot a lot of support like from um, encapsulation with IP IP, with uh, VLANs, with VXLANs. Um, I actually didn't even list, list it here, but there's even WireGuard VPN support in the CNI, so you can have the different uh, servers talking uh, WireGuard, could be encrypted. And you can also like stack these things. <laughs> so it's got kind of it's like, if you're already thinking, wow, my head is exploding, then with Kubernetes, there's always something coming more, which, you know, after it's exploded, it will make small explosions of the rest of you. Um, so with CNIs, you can also do routing. You can do uh, variants of uh, BGP. Um, this depends, obviously, on the CNI, whether or not it's supported. And you can do mesh routing so that every <laughs> of your servers is actually uh, routing to another server for the workload, or if you're going back to, like, a top of rack switch or uh, whatever way you want to do it. Some, but not all of the CNIs are actually doing IPAM, that is uh, IP address management. And this is important because some of them don't support IPv6 and some of them do. What is not in a CNI, uh, just to like give you like a rough overview of where it ends, uh, is uh, DNS. DNS is usually uh, deployed in a Kubernetes cluster by core DNS which uh, is a set of containers that are running inside the cluster um, for providing in-cluster DNS. Um, so the address assignments can, the decision can be made by the uh, typical Kubernetes components, or as I said, by the CNI um, <coughs> parts. Then there is uh, another component, which is quite interesting, and that is kube proxy. So in the Kubernetes world, it's quite normal that any of your servers, or node, that's the uh, Kubernetes term, might receive traffic that is not destined for the node itself, but should go somewhere else. And uh, Kube proxy uh, is a fancy way of moving traffic around inside your cluster, which arrived at an incorrect node. How can this happen? Uh, this might, for instance, happen if your whole cluster is peering with your upstream or with, with your uh, top of the rack switch, and all of the nodes are announcing all the whole Kubernetes network, for instance, then uh, the Kubernetes cluster needs to find out itself like where to put the uh, resulting request in the end. So, um, but how, how does it actually look like uh, in Kubernetes? So IPv6 only support and IPv6 support in general has been added quite recently, which means uh, something around, I believe a year ago, was uh, more or less the first commits that were landed for IPv6 support in general. Um, as mentioned originally, Kubernetes only supports one interface by default. So when you were switching on IPv6, you would automatically switch off IPv4 because from, from concept, there was no second IP address. Um, the dual stack support is quite recent. I think that was this year. I didn't look it up. It's I think also not so important because if you want to go dual stack or IPv6 only, um, if you're using Kubernetes 122, um, which is out for a while already, and I think even 121, um, then you're on the safe side. So you don't need to worry about this anymore. So anything <coughs> recent uh, will work and you don't have to patch it anymore. Um, before I continue, um, this sounds all fuzzy and warm and nice, and uh, it kind of is like this right now. But um, until the IPv6 only support has been properly added, there was kind of partial support. So Kubernetes has a lot of internal components, like an etcd server, which is a database. It has the DNS servers, which I mentioned already. It has an API server. And all of these also live on IP addresses, which I think kind of makes sense for, for everybody. And before the proper release of IPv6 support, some, they would accept, some of the components would accept IPv6 parameters, like an address. Some of them wouldn't. So you can have like a kind of really inconsistent cluster, like 
Some components are configured with some IPv6 networks, some components are not. So this was a real horror uh, until, until uh, IPv6 support had been added because you were able to pass in some segments of uh, IPv6 configurations, but they wouldn't be applied everywhere in the cluster. Just imagine this, like you have something doesn't listen to IPv6, something listens to IPv4. It is really a madness. But yeah, that was the old Kubernetes times like a year ago. Um, so in terms of CNIs, this is also interesting because even before Kubernetes officially supported IPv6, uh, Calico, which is a, a CNI, already supported IPv6 in Kubernetes. So while the Kubernetes cluster didn't really know how to handle this, there were no configurations options for handling IPv6, the Calico uh, CNI, which is supported, this is, there are some catches with this because the actual in uh, cluster um, components like the ETCD server and so on, they were still running on IPv4, but your workload would run on IPv6 and IPv4. But it's, you, you grasp a little bit like how the architecture or the infrastructure of Kubernetes looks like. It's very flexible, which also um, gives you a high degree of complexity. Um, today, if you start uh, looking at the Kubernetes cluster, implementing it yourself, uh, there are two CNIs uh, which I can recommend. Uh, one of them is Calico, which we have here in production use. And the other one is Cilium, which we have in development use. Um, Cilium looks more scalable from what I can see, how our engineers here. Um, the problem there is Cilium doesn't have integrated BGP support, uh, but external BGP support. Respectively, some of you might con uh, correct me right now, Cilium does have BGP support, but not for the IPv6 world. So um, if you want to be safe uh, at the moment with IPv6 in Kubernetes, uh, I would recommend to go with Calico for the moment, even though Cilium is probably better scalable in the end. So if you're thinking about doing it yourself, and this is also a bit of the takeaway here, like uh, if you're interested in this, the biggest catch of setting up Kubernetes IPv6 only is you need to do a lot of decisions in terms of net networking. Uh, in the Kubernetes world, you basically have the pods, which are containers plus plus, which means um, containers, the pod can be multiple containers, but they share one IP address. And you have services, which is used for addressing multiple containers potentially. And you need to think about like, how do you expose these IP addresses? Are you getting traffic routed from your network? Are you traffic, putting traffic into a VPN? Are you, get, are you using IP IP? What is your choice? And this problem cannot be taken away by Kubernetes uh, because you basically need to decide what you want. So that, that is, I would say the most tricky thing to know what you want because especially when you start with Kubernetes, you don't know what Kubernetes can do. So you're trying uh, maybe different things and then you find out, well, okay, this is my design. Then you find your CNI and then you find out, oh, well, it only supports parts of my design. So you need to go back and adjust your design matching to the CNI that you actually selected. This is a bit like a, I would say, a typical forth and back going when you start with Kubernetes. <laughs> so I, I would like to show you one example before I go into more of the fun details here. Um, a typical Kubernetes cluster, uh, for us, we are using uh, Qualico without any kind of encapsulation. So there's no VLAN, VXLAN, WireGuard, IP, IP, nothing around the packet. It's plain on the wire. Um, we're using BGP with our own routers. Um, and if we tell the cluster to route within itself, so wherever a packet arrives, it doesn't go back to uh, the router, it, it stays within the network. And Calico by default removes uh, the information of like which node has which subnet uh, assigned. So every node actually uh, announces all the subnets to your uh, infrastructure. This way, what I mentioned before with the kube proxy, the packet enters anywhere in your, in your uh, Kubernetes cluster and is then being distributed. Um, when you say keep origin next stop on, it actually only announces uh, one hop, the one where the uh, final packet is going to. And uh, this way, 
you actually save one or two hops depending on your configuration. Um, there's some attribute, and I will talk about this a bit more later. This is a DNS domain that you can assign to a Kubernetes cluster. And per cluster, you also have a pod network, which you see here uh, is a regular slash 64. But then there's also a service network, and you will see there's something funky here. It's not a slash 64. And also the pod network is not a slash 48, which you might have imagined. So the service network, there's an ongoing bug in Kubernetes, and I, I have to laugh because um, they have a map inside the API server which basically needs to allocate enough space for all possible mappings. I'm totally simplifying here. This is not technically, technically completely correct, but basically uh, with slash 108, we have 20 bit of uh, space where we can define uh, service addresses. Because of the way how it is saved, um, we can't use the slash 64. This is really weird because if you assign a slash 64 to the service network, Kubernetes will just fail and tell you, well, <laughs> It's not possible. We don't support uh, slash 64s. Um, this is an ongoing bug, and uh, I believe there might be a solution for this at some point in the future. However, having two to the power of 20 different services in one Kubernetes cluster is probably still good enough, even though from an IPv6 point of view, it's a bit awkward. And that's all there is. So what do you see here? This is all the configuration that we pass into a new Kubernetes cluster. Everything else is nowadays completely standard Calico or Kubernetes. So no other changes are there anymore. The cat, cat, I'm just seeing a cat. Um, so let, let, let's come a bit more for the interesting things in Kubernetes, especially when it's IPv6 only or IPv6 based. So every cluster has a domain. And usually that domain is cluster.local. Total nonsense. If you if you look at it from a networking perspective, if you think about the bigger picture, most Kubernetes clusters at the moment are private RFC 1918 space only. As said, there's an internal core DNS server, and the pattern that we have inside a cluster is you have a service name. Let's say that is a Nextcloud, a Jitsi, video meeting, whatever you want to call your service. The namespaces. So uh, we could say there is uh, Jitsi dot UK IPv6 Council dot SVC dot cluster domain. Now, if services, it, like in our case here, are, are IPv6 based, you're getting with this a global reach reachable, completely automated DNS. So you just create a service, <laughs> and you have a globally reachable name. And let me go into this into detail because I, I, I'm really a fan of this. So. If you have a domain such as hypothetically k at s dot oo and you're setting your cluster domain to something like cx cluster x dot k at s dot oo and then you create a service then it will automatically generate service name dot default as c2 dot k at s k at s dot oo and this is actually a real life ungleich Kubernetes cluster so every service within there that we deploy is automatically worldwide reachable, no DNS configuration whatsoever, because this is kind of an like internal DNS feature, which you know we is to some degree misuse, <laughs> but it works. How, how does it work? So generally speaking, the whole IP, uh, Kubernetes cluster is IPv6 only. So if you're not doing something smart, your whole DNS resolution is only able uh, to function with IPv6 capable resolvers. So thanks for the, for the I think, was in the Sky talk before. Like, you need, or was BT, uh, you need IPv6 capable resolvers. Otherwise, you can't resolve things in IPv6 only Kubernetes cluster. Obviously, what you see here in the slide at the very bottom is an IPv4 address. So, because our services are still, uh, should be reachable or resolvable, resolvable in the first place from the IPv4 internet. We're adding a NAT64 service for the name server that is inside the Kubernetes cluster to the world. So this IPv4 address is completely outside the cluster, is in an edge node. And this is actually a real life um, record here for the C2 cluster, which says uh, the name server for the C2 cluster is cube DNS, which is the service name, dot namespace cube system dot service dot sc2 dot k at s dot oo. And here's a glue record for in the name server to actually help clients to find the cluster. 
for the cluster DNS. So this is uh, not hypothetical, this is real world right now. Um, so, but, and, 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 you know, now we can resolve from the IPv4 world, but what, what do we do with IPv4 traffic? And now I, I, I hope everyone bra brace yourself and this is going to be, get a little bit crazy. We do have for a long time uh, proxies, like standard HTTP, HTTPS proxies that do take an layer seven HTTP request, IPv4 based, and you know, just a standard machine takes it IPv4 packet in and forwards it to the backend, which is IPv6. So this is a standard service in, at Ungleich like for two or three years now. Now, we want to have this proxy inside the Kubernetes cluster where it is already IPv6 only. So how, how the heck does it get to the IPv4 packet? It can't because you know, it's in an IPv6 only world. So let's have a look at this. So an IPv4 client wants to request something from, the, uh, from an IPv4 address, lands at a router with NAT64 slash SIAT configured. The router translates the IPv4 address to an IPv6 address, <laughs> lands on the proxy, which is IPv6 only. That proxy then uh, does the IPv4, which is already IPv6, translation to the IPv6 nodes by means of layer seven information. So this is the host header or the TLS SNI information. So the, this proxy here does the logical thing. And this service here does the IPv4 to IPv6 uh, conversion. And well, if you're an IPv6 client, well, you just go directly to the application uh, service, which is, you know, two, <laughs> two steps less of translation. Um, this is especially interesting. I've been involved in, in some uh, low latency projects recently. And if you go the IPv4 path, well, obviously you have to have some additional latency. And this makes it a quite convincing case for going uh, IPv6 space, especially if you're in a territory with mainly IPv6 requests um, for going to the service here. So short recap, craziness here is the IPv4 to IPv6 proxy is actually an IPv6 to IPv6 proxy, which is proxied before with a single IPv4 address mapping IPv4 to IPv6, and it works. Uh, so quite some um, uh, customer deployments are now actually uh, inside here, which are IPv6, completely IPv6 only, and even the proxies IPv6 only, and it works because of NUT64. So that is the craziness that you get when you go IPv6 only Kubernetes clusters. Uh, conceptually, there are some things that don't really match in Kubernetes. Kubernetes said a majority of the Kubernetes clusters out there is RFC 1918. It's designed that the pods, the workload is in private IP space. Usually in a Kubernetes cluster, you have an ingress. An ingress is basically, you know, like, like a networking is where the input from the internet from the outside comes to. Um, now in the IPv6 world, it doesn't really make sense because a service, which is usually internal in Kubernetes, is already world reachable. Um, we've put out some blog articles about this and we are also in touch with the Kubernetes uh, community there. There are some concepts that don't really fit anymore. Also, the pods are potentially globally reachable. Uh, the services are potentially globally reachable. Um, what Kubernetes has, and this actually solves the problem nicely, is something that's called network policies. And like a network policy <laughs> usually is, you can assign, uh, say, uh, pods that are labeled with something uh, are reachable from outside or are reachable from inside or are reachable by only other labeled pods. So you can easily um, decide who can reach what without any big uh, trouble. But overall, um, some concepts in the Kubernetes world need to be challenged. And this is a process that we are also in at the moment. It's like you have to rethink uh, patterns that are not thought to be like this because Kubernetes was born in, in, in a private IP uh, address space setting. So the good thing is um, overall, IPv6 only Kubernetes work fine nowadays. The tricky thing is a little bit that the documentation is not always there. So if you want to start with it and you're looking around, 
then you might not find the most up-to-date or best documentation because the thinking process still is there, you're going IPv4. Um, there are multiple different CNIs supporting IPv6. And if you need IPv4, you can just use a standard tool set uh, for uh, getting access there. That's it from my side. Um, if after a meeting you want to continue the talk, there are, uh, I know it's, it's hype and new, it's not so new anymore. There's matrix chat, uh, IPv6 chat, and the Kubernetes chat. And almost everything I was talking about today is also online. If you look for the Ungleich Kubernetes infrastructure, um, all information is uh, open source there. And that's it from my side. And I'm looking for any questions if anybody has one. So I think there are a few in the chat. Uh, something you just probably have to scroll through. Sorry, I have to get the door. <laughs> I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> the, the wonders of uh, home office conferences. Nico, can you see the chat to do at least a couple of the questions before we move on? I'm trying to get it. Uh, I'm trying backwards because it's easy from there. Um, huh, how to avoid NUT 6 6? There's actually, I'm not sure if there's no NUT 6 6 in place here. So I'm not sure. So I will go to the previous question because I don't understand the question. Um, but maybe you can clarify. Um, not six, you can see. Nah, huh, not six, six. Huh, no, no. There, there's there's zero direction in this this direction. Z zero. Um, I think the people who are using IPv6 in Kubernetes are going uh, with global addresses. I don't see anybody using EULA or something else with not six, six. This is um, not something I've seen anywhere. I mean, yeah. perhaps it's because people are used to that model with the foreign Kubernetes that it's just some kind of assumption. That we're we doing it. Yeah, I, I think so. It might be useful to try and put some information out about that if it's a, if it's a, <laughs> something that's starting to spread that that's going to be normal. Um, yeah. Um, in terms of traffic, uh, it's actually quite nice for us. We're at the moment at around uh, ninety percent IPv6 traffic. Um, mm -hmm which is the regular and, and the 10% of uh, knotted traffic. So this is quite nice. Yeah, Giles has made a comment in the chat about um, not being used to map services to endpoints. Is it isn't used for that indicator, it's used to map services to endpoints. Right, ah, right, right, right. So yeah, okay. Uh, technically, yeah, this can, oh yeah, yes, you're right. So this can be not, not 6.6. This can also be higher level proxying, uh, completely right there. Um, so technically this is actually, yes, you're right. It's not 6.6 from global address to global address because um, that's also a part of the design of Kubernetes. So you will forward uh, packets with rewrites to another node. That's unfortunately correct. So you do have some, if you're not careful, you have actually some loss on the source IP address information there. That's right. 